In this Masters of the Air Episode 7 clip, Rosie's bomber is attacking the VKF Ball Bearing Works factory near Berlin. The intent of this video is to address the historical accuracy of the bombing events as portrayed in this episode. This video is in part due to channel viewer comments mostly regarding the scene showing too many bombs dropped as an unrealistic narrative. All of the footage shown is part of a three minute clip publicly released on YouTube by the Apple TV channel. A summary narrative of the March 8, 1944 mission is shown on this page from a declassified 8th Air Force narrative of operations. Key points of the document are, three bombardment divisions were sent, representing some 10 combat wings dispatched to attack the VKF ball bearing works. 470 bombers attacked the plant. 66 dispatched B-17s made up the 13th combat wing. The 100th bomb group was chosen to lead the 13th combat wing. Since the 100th was to lead the entire 66 plane wing, it was issued a special PFF B-17. A PFF bomber is also called a Pathfinder bomber. The PFF B-17 was brought in to lead the wing because of its blind bombing radar system and specially trained crew. Its ball turret was replaced by an H-2X radar. A radar operator station was added in the radio room. The H-2X radar set is also called a Mickey set and the radar crewman was called the Mickey operator. The advantage of the Pathfinder is that they do all the navigation and bombing for the entire wing. The Pathfinder can bomb through clouds by by targeting the aim point by radar. If they arrive at the target and visual conditions exist, they will still be responsible for sighting the target for the entire wing visually by using the Norton bomb site alone. Bombing by visual targeting is always more accurate than by radar. The Pathfinder's bombardier will be the only bomber sighting on the target. The Pathfinder's first bomb out of the bomb bay will be a smoke bomb. The other planes watch the lead plane during the bomb run. When the lead plane drops his bombs, the other planes will drop their bombs. None of the other 65 bombardiers in the wing will be using their Norton bomb sites. The other 65 planes bombardiers will be downgraded to a toggle ear, just releasing their bombs when the lead plane releases his bombs. The 13th combat wing looks something like this. The 100th bomb group is represented by 15 bombers in formation. Colonel Bennett's wing lead pathfinder is here. Rosie's plane is here in the high squadron. The position of the bombers within the group is based on the tactical mission report. The PFF lead is highlighted here. Rosie's plane is here on the right in the high squadron. The 100th group does not contain a low squadron. The 95th bomb group is in the wing's high position and the 390th bomb group is in the wing's low position. Three wings make up the third bombardment group. The 45th is leading the bombardment group, the 13th, and the trailing 4th. It was the 45th that was getting hammered in the episode and missed a turn. Ah, I can't get a shot at them. They're kicking up the 45th. I have green, green flares from Colonel Bennett's ship. Noted in the log that the 45th wing missed the turn for the IP. We are under Colonel Bennett's command, turning with him to the target. Over. The target was attacked while the planes were in formation. As discussed on this 100th bomb group post-mission narrative, the bombs were dropped by Pathfinder Q. This page is Rosenthal's post-mission interrogation form from the March 8th mission. The position of Rosie's plane in the formation is circled here. The formation is marked with the annotation, dropped on lead, visual primary. Rosie, like the other planes within the wing, all dropped their bombs when the PFF lead dropped their bombs. This page from the post-mission PFF lead ship statistical flak form outlines the parameters of the bomb run. The bombs were released at an altitude of 22,000 feet. The plane was on a heading of 240 degrees. The straight and level bomb run duration equated to 60 seconds and the bombs were released at 2.37 p.m. Target visibility was good and unlimited. This is why the bombs were released visually by the PFF plane's Norton bomb site. The radar was not needed. A handwritten note indicates the Mickey operator was helpful through the entire trip. This clip shows Rosie's bombardier taking control of the plane, sighting the target with the Norton bomb site, and releasing the bombs. The clip does not reflect how the bombs were actually released. The clip should show the bombardier watching the 13th Wing's PFF lead ship smoke bomb drop and toggle release his bombs when he observes the PFF plane smoke bomb. This would have been a great audience teaching moment showing the changing bombing tactics as the war progressed. Such a missed opportunity. 
The bomb loadout is listed on this 100th Bombardment Group's Operational Statistics Report. The columns are the plane's pilot, squadron, aircraft tail number, bomb loadout, crew casualties, and plane's battle damage. Rosie's plane is in this row. All of the 100th B-17 bomb loadouts were 30 100-pound class incendiaries and 10 100-pound class general purpose bombs. Each plane dropped 40 bombs. One of the B-17's bomb bay racks is highlighted in this image from the plane's bomb bay. The four B-17 bomb bay racks can hold up to 42 bombs. This page outlines the type and quantity of bombs to carry during the mission. Since M-17s were not available, the bombers were loaded with 10 M-30 100-pound class general purpose bombs and 30 M-47 incendiary bombs. The intervalometer will be set at 200 feet. This loadout is consistent with the type of bombs expected for the destruction of a light industrial factory, as shown on this page from a 1944 Army Air Forces Board document titled Joint Army-Navy Committee on Bombs and Fuses. For high-altitude attack on light industrial factory, an alternate bomb load consists of 100-pound general-purpose bombs mixed with M47 incendiary bombs. Incendiaries are force multipliers. The effects of incendiary bombs on factories is shown on this page from an October 1943 Chief of Air Staff Intelligence report titled Japan Incendiary Attack Data. The British studied the damaging effects of bombs on industrial plants and found that incendiaries were five times more damaging than high explosives on a per ton basis. Incendiaries were found to be 7 to 21 times more damaging than high explosive bombs when attacking Japanese urban areas, as discussed in the channel's previous videos. A cutaway of the M30 100 pound class general purpose bomb is shown on this page from a 1947 U.S. Explosive Ordnance document. The bomb weighs 115 pounds and is filled with 57 pounds of TNT. M47 incendiaries were used by B-29 Pathfinders in the firebombing campaign on Japanese urban areas. They have great appliance fire starting capabilities and are used for target marking. Characteristics of the M47 incendiary bomb are shown on this page from a 1945 National Research Council document titled Weapons Data Fire Impact Explosion. Each bomb weighs 72 pounds and are filled with 40 pounds of napalm. Each bomb liberates 69,000 BTUs of heat. This image shows M47s ready to be loaded on a B-17. This page outlines the effects of an M47 static burst from a 1946 National Research Defense Council document titled Fire Warfare, Incendiaries, and Flamethrowers. The napalm covers a radii of 75 feet from the bomb's detonation. 50 globs of napalm will still be burning 10 minutes after detonation. This chart outlines the ballistic parameters of the M47. The M47's time of flight from a 22,000 altitude drop equates to 43.3 seconds. A single bomber's incendiary strike pattern should look like this. The expelled napalm flaming discharge will extend to a diameter of 150 feet. The spacing of each of the 30 incendiary bomb strikes match the intervalometer setting of 200 feet. The bomb should strike along a straight line. Each bomb will strike 43.3 seconds from release. The total length of the 30 incendiary bomb strike line equates to 1.1 miles. Since 44 bombers dropped on the Pathfinder, and if they all carried the same bomb loadout, we should see a string of 44 M47s clustered around the target, or 1,320 M47 strikes. That's 8,250 gallons of napalm. Although the series has embellished some scenes like the fighter escort quantities, they are underrepresenting the number of bombs released. I counted 27 bomb releases per B-17. They should be dropping 40 bombs. Also, to get the proper 200-foot bomb strike distance, the bombs need to be released every 0.53 seconds. In this clip, they are released every 0.09 seconds. They are being released 5.9 times too fast. The bomb strike spacing will be 34 feet instead of 200 feet. The release speed in this clip has been slowed down to match the intervalometer setting of 200 feet. In summary, bomb targeting was done by the wing pathfinder. All other bombers in the wing would just toggle release their planes 40 bombs. No fiddling with the Norton bomb site. The number of bombs released is underrepresented. 27 bombs were released and it should have been 40. The bombs were released too fast. They should have slowed down by a factor of 5.9. 
Again, Apple had 16 technical consultants and historians on staff to get the details correct. Not sure why any of these issues were not addressed. Any one of them could have raised their hand and said, let's show 40 bombs released to match the actual loadout and slow down the releases to match the intervalometer settings. If you've enjoyed these Masters of the Air fact-checking videos, please consider engaging by liking and or commenting.